All right, everybody, welcome to the Mike Norman MMT podcast. Today, we have a very special guest on. Uh, if you've been following MMT for any length of time, I'm sure you've you've heard about this guy. He's a prolific author. He's he's a, a just a, a great economics professor, and he's been really he's one of the founders of MMT. He's been in the vanguard of of pushing uh, MMT, you know, the the academic knowledge further and further. Um, he is Randy Ray. He's senior scholar at the Levy Economics Institute and professor of economics at Bard College. And um, he's here to talk to us today. And one of the reasons I asked him to come on uh, was because he wrote an article about, uh, I don't know, a week, a week and a half ago uh, when we had the SVB uh, bank collapse, talking about why monetary policy is the wrong tool to fight inflation. But anyway, Randy, thank you for coming on the podcast. Uh, I really appreciate it. At the end, I'm going to mention that uh, you, you have written other books. We might want to just start off with the fact that I think you wrote the very first book on MMT, Understanding Modern Money, back in 1998. I think it was you, uh, Warren Mosler at the time, said, you know, why don't you why don't you write that book? It needs to be understood, right? And you did. Yep. I, I believe there's right. a second edition that just recently came out too. Um, well, no, uh, I, I am working on a second edition of that, but uh, my uh, primer came out in 2012. Right. 2015 was a second edition. Now a third edition will be out. Right, modern money theory of primer on macroeconomics for sovereign monetary systems. Now, this is this is really the first academic textbook dealing with MMT or or um, talking about economics through the prism through the lens of MMT. Because that you know, when I went to school, I went to University of Pennsylvania and then and then uh, UCLA. I mean, the book we used back then was, you know, it was uh, Samuelson, Paul Samuelson's book. That was it. And um, so we really, there hasn't been anything in terms of an academic textbook. Did you write that with Bill Mitchell? Was that a collaboration? Yeah. The So the textbook is with Bill Mitchell and Martin Watts. They're both Australians. And Bill, of course, was one of the creators of MMT too. Right, I should have mentioned that. That came out in 2019. We're working on a second edition of that one too. How arduous was it to get that book together? I'm sure you had it in your head for a long time. You know, this needed to be done, but I mean, you know, it must have been a tough task. The te textbook took 12 years. <laughs> Much right. too long. You're a very patient man. You have a lot more patience than I do. I can tell you that. So let's get into this a little bit. Like um, we all know what's going on uh, since March of last year, 2022, in reaction to what I think was a lot of pressure from the media, uh, the, the political elements, uh, academic economics. You know, we saw inflation, which originally was uh, declared by, uh, you know, not only Powell, but Yellen, a bunch of people like this is transitory. We had a total lockdown of the global economy, uh, inability to, to produce. We had supply chain issues. And at that time, I, I thought they were correct in the way they characterized what was going on. But you know how it goes with, with media and political pressure. Uh, they switched stances and now they started to, not now, but they've been raising interest rates now for a year aggressively. And you say this is the wrong policy. Please explain why. Yeah, the patience was the correct policy. Uh, and so they were patient for about a year. And then, as you said, people like Larry Summers, uh, was out there all the time pressuring them, telling them they had to get the unemployment rate up above 6% and so on. So anyway, eventually they they followed the path that uh, central bankers have been following uh, for about 40 years. 
which is they started raising interest rates. And that that's, uh, even if you believe the orthodox story about how that's supposed to work, it didn't make any sense because the inflation is coming mostly from the supply side, from bottlenecks, supply chain disruption, and of course, China shutting down their economy. We consume a lot of stuff from China. Right. Uh, and, and so we had shortages. And so we fought that on the demand side. Uh, I mean, that's that's what the Fed thought they were doing, trying to depress what they thought was excessive demand. But our problem was on the supply side and raising interest rates only hurts the supply side even more. So it's exactly the wrong policy. And then the, there is the, the uh, very important element that um, for uh, more than a decade, we've had extremely low inflation, extremely low interest rates, and the expectation that this is the new normal. And if that's the new normal, banks don't worry about rate hikes. And it makes perfectly good sense to go ahead and purchase long-term assets that have low returns because you think inflation is going to be low, you think the interest rate is going to be low, and so you're happy enough with low returns. And let me just add, if you go back one year ago, March last year, the Fed thought that uh, the Fed funds rate would be at 2% right now, this month, and that the inflation rate would be between 2 and 3%. So this is what the Fed thought. And uh, markets were pretty much in line with that too. And now, uh, you know, with um, great hindsight, everyone's saying, boy, those banks were stupid <laughs> to hold these long-term assets. Right. <laughs> the, the Fed itself believed this story, right? How can you fault the banks? Right. No, you can't. The other thing that, that uh, often... Uh like amazes me, amuses me almost, is the fact that w we see real-time examples of this policy where the outcome is completely inverse to what the goal is. Like, if it were true that high interest rates were was the tool to squash inflation, then literally countries like uh, Argentina and Turkey should have the lowest inflation rates in the world and you know, vice versa, Japan, which by the way, I have to give credit to the bank, uh, Central Bank of Japan because they didn't fall in line with, with the other central banks and they, they kept rates negative actually. Um, and they are completely reliant on imported energy, which we had that big energy spike and their inflation rate hardly went up at all. Uh, and you know, they stuck with the program and, and it's, it's funny for me because, you know, mainstream economists, you know this better than I do, of course, mainstream economists like to think of themselves as scientists, right? Like they go, they approach everything with the scientific method. But everyone knows that that any, you know, credible scientist, if the empirical evidence does not, you know, bear out what their theories are, they go back to the drawing board and, and reevaluate that. Why is why is this orthodoxy something that just it seems like it cannot be changed and it exists only within economics? Yes, um, it is a dogma. It is not based on any empirical observations or regularities. Um, it is a um, a very flawed theory. And I, what about a year ago, Dimitri Papadimitriou and I wrote a piece um, on uh, the way the Fed looks at inflation, which we can go into in more detail if you want. But the, we uh, found um, this uh, economist at the Fed, last name Rudd, who wrote a piece that said that this whole story, the whole orthodox approach to inflation and inflation fighting uh, is completely uh, magical thinking. 
it it's not based on any kind of reality it's not really even based on a good theoretical framework uh it's just um uh, uh co complete hocus pocus the other thing that's interesting that that seems to be lost in a, in the conversation especially when it comes to policy um is the fact that rate hikes increase fiscal transfers through you know through the uh, uh the, the rate uh, conduit i mean so in other words um you have the government as a net payer of interest. So like when the Fed raises rates, and I see this because as a part of what I do in my in my economic analysis and, and my report is I put this out every week. And, and it's, we, we've now had what well, we're like five, six months into the fiscal year. We're already like almost 130 billion above where we were last year in terms of fiscal transfers. In other words, by fiscal transfers, you know what I'm talking about. It's people receiving money. So, so like there's this narrative that, yeah, it's going to slow everything down because rates are going up and less people are going to demand credit. But at the same time, you know, really all it is is a redistribution of income. I mean, you know, uh, debtors will have to pay more, but then creditors are getting uh, transfers from the government. It's like it's like sending out checks. Well, that, so, the, and that's Warren Mosler's big point, that raising uh, rates increases government spending on interest, and that goes into the economy as income that can be spent. So under some conditions, raising rates should lift aggregate demand instead of lowering aggregate demand. Now, even the orthodox empirical estimates of what we call the interest rate elasticity of spending. In other words, uh, if we raise rates, how much does that reduce uh, people's willingness to borrow and spend? We know that it has very little impact. Uh, American consumers are used to credit card uh, interest rates at 20%, right? right. <laughs> Boosting it to 22% is not going to get them to stop using their credit card. Right. So it just doesn't work that way. So there's the income effect. Uh, that Warren and you just uh, talked about. There also is the cost effect. Interest is a cost of doing business. Every firm out there has short-term debt they're using to make their payroll, and uh, that raises their cost. They're going to pass that along to consumers. Exactly. So the cost channel is going to increase prices. And then the final one is uh, if you raise interest rates by 400 basis points, four percentage points in a year, you're going to cause a financial crisis. There's just no question about this. It happens every time. And I think this is the main channel. This is the way interest rates work. You cause a severe financial crisis that crashes the economy. That's what Volcker did. Um, and that is what we're likely to do right now. That is how, if it works, that's how it's going to work. That seems like kind of like what they wanted to do, but but it, it's it's fascinating because the Fed engages in these policies that end up, you know, like you're saying, maybe crash the economy or run counter to uh, what they're trying to do. And then they have to come up with some uh, other kind of sort of Rube Goldberg, you know, situation. I I'll give you an example. All during the time when the Fed was doing QE, you know, big time QE during the COVID lockdowns and everything like that, they were loading up the banks with so much reserve assets that it literally put the banks on the threshold of insolvency because they needed capital to hold those reserve assets. I think you remember that at one point that they suspended the inclusion of reserves and treasuries in the calculation of the leverage ratio. And then that expired, uh, well, I guess it was in uh, 2021, and they kept doing QE and you know loading the banks up with reserve assets to the point where they had to create a new vehicle, the RRP, the reverse repo facility, 
for the banks to shunt the those excess reserves off into another place. They didn't even want them. So like the Fed was doing this thing, right? Putting the banks in violation of the Fed's own, you know, regulations. And then instead of just stopping the QE, they said, okay, well, we'll invent this new facility so you can stick the reserves over there. It's crazy. <laughs> it, it really is crazy. It just shows you uh, how ridiculous their whole theory is. So they, they have gradually transitioned. You, you remember the old days when we had Milton Friedman. So monetary policy uh, was very simple to understand and explain. Money causes inflation. So what are we going to do? We're going to control the money supply. So that was Volcker's excuse for what he did, raising interest rates to 20% and killing the financial markets and the economy. Okay, but he never hit the money targets. And money became completely disassociated from the inflation rate. So the Fed said, oh, we need a different story. And so gradually they produced this story that inflation is determined by expectations, not by anything going on in the real world. It has nothing to do with the real world. If people expect inflation, there will be magically inflation. So how do we fight that? We get them to expect there won't be inflation. How do we do that? Well, we signal with the interest rate, okay? But then you get the global financial crisis and you get ZERP, the interest rate's zero. <laughs> What can we do now? We've already signaled we want inflation. Okay, we've right. got zero. Inflation is running at 1%. We want two. How can we signal? Oh, quantitative easing. <laughs> it has no impact on, on in the inflation rate, except if it gets people to expect inflation. But people won't expect inflation because there is no inflation. They're not that stupid, right? And so we have no expectations of inflation, even up to a year ago, uh, the market still did not expect inflation. And yeah, they, still don't. Sorry, <laughs> they still don't expect 6% inflation, even though we actually hit six. So how can expectations have caused 6% inflation when the markets never expected 6% inflation? It's just so silly. Yeah, I gave props to the Bank of Japan a couple of minutes ago, but I, I'll take some of that back because they kind of did the same thing. They were sitting there for 10 years saying, how do we get inflation up? Like, just it's not working. And, you know, it's like the, the woodcutter who says, uh, I keep chopping this wood and it's still too short. You know, like they kept rates at zero and then they went to negative. Like, we can't, we can't stoke any inflation here. Well, maybe that's because, you know, you have the, the, the negative rate and, and we see that um, in action. Now you're, you're out there among academics. I, I'll give you my personal feeling like, like MMT has definitely come a long way. I remember when, when I first met you and maybe we go back not quite 20 years. I met Moser like, uh, I think in, uh, 2002. So that's 21 years ago. I met you a couple of years after that. There's no, I, I, I'm sure in your head, like, you're proud of, you know, the accomplishments of guys like you and Moser and, and Kelton and the others and Bill Mitchell, you know, where it has come to. But at the same time, I want to ask you if, if this still, if you have a lot of frustration because it, it's attacked and it is derided and a lot of it is just these straw man arguments and you really don't see it with the, I guess, with the exception of UMKC and, and uh, you're over there at Levy Institute. I mean, it, 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 it's not like proliferate, proliferate. I could be wrong, but it doesn't seem to pro be proliferating in the uh, in academia anywhere. And, and certainly it to me, it doesn't seem like it's going anywhere in policy. Well, you know, um... You you mentioned Paul Samuelson, and he said economics actually does make advances one death at a time. There's a lot of people who got to die before uh, MMT is going to take over. Uh, but, but you know, there 
Uh, I see it all the time. MMT is in the classroom all over the country now. I, I don't mean in every classroom, but I mean in classrooms all over the country. It's spread way, way beyond UMKC. And um, the I talk to reporters uh, all the time, and you know they uh, many, many of them are sympathetic to MMT and they want to get the MMT angle on various questions. Stephanie's out there uh, talking. John Yarmuth, who unfortunately is retiring. Oh, he was great. He was he, great. You know, nobody understands this better than him. I, I met with him, talked to him. He assured me that the Democrats on the um, Congressional Budget Committee uh, understood this. He said they can't say it out in public, but they understand this. And then he could say it in public because... He knew he was going to retire. Uh, so, you know, there there is that problem. Politicians are not leaders. They cannot be leaders, yeah. right? So as MMT is embraced by others, it will become safe for politicians to admit that they understand this. So I think we've made a lot of progress. Warren always thought, you know, this was going to be an easy job to convince the profession because... You know, these are supposed to be smart people and so on. I would I never believed that. If <laughs> if, if you have a PhD, you've devoted almost 20 years of your life uh, to a strand of thinking, and it doesn't matter how wrong it is, uh, you're not going to drop it. That's that's why Samuelson Samuelson said one death at a time. It, they will like carry that to their grave. It's like the old quote, I, I just pulled it up here from Keynes, who said, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. I, yeah. I think that's a great one. And uh, along those lines, I, I often get asked, people ask me like, you think like people really know, like when they say that they're talking about like some of these politicians and, and, and you know, leaders, so to speak. Do you think they really know and they're just kind of like they're not saying it because they need to support a certain agenda? And I, I tell a story and I've told a story uh, many times when I used to be on Fox and I met um, David Stockman, who used to be Reagan's uh, budget guy. And I remember him coming into Fox one day and he was like, you know, this is crazy. The, the, the Fed is uh, lowering interest rates and uh, the, the Chinese are never going to buy our bonds. And I'm like, well, you know, they don't need to buy our bonds. I, I, I mean, the money to buy bonds comes from government spending itself. And he's like, no, 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 we need China. They're our creditor and blah, blah, blah. Right. And then, um, he came back a few months later and I saw him again. And uh, then he was he was complaining like, oh, the, the rates are going up. What's the Fed doing here? And I, I asked him, I said, I thought you said, you know, it was about the Chinese and not the Fed. So like I tell people there's an easy way to figure out if somebody's like faking it, like if he has some kind of ulterior motive and and, he, you know, it's like a conspiracy or something. When they contradict themselves openly, you know that they're just, they're dumb. They don't get it. <laughs> yeah. So now the Fed again, and the other thing I, I've noticed about this Powell Fed in particular, like this guy he just does whatever the market says. Like I follow, uh, you know, the futures markets very closely. And, you know, the CME has this uh, site, they call it the Fed Watch tool. It gives you the probability based on where Fed fund futures are trading uh, as to where the next, you know, policy rate's gonna be at the meeting. And whatever that rate is, that's what he does. And so I think to myself, like, What's the point of having a Fed? Like, if you just, if that's all you're going to do, I mean, you're the monopolist, right? You have the ability to set the rate. That's why, again, I mentioned the Bank of Japan, which didn't go along with that. 
I mean, we just have a succession of these people who come in and uh, they just continue to do the same thing over and over again. That's that's Einstein's theory of uh, insanity, right? Yeah. If you go back, um, you know, after 1994, when the Fed, when Greenspan was caught lying to Congress, which can put you in jail, uh, the Fed changed its uh, operating procedure to start um, announcing what the target was and also agreed to release their transcripts with a five year lag. If you go back and read the transcripts, it's very interesting because when uh, as the Fed changed its policies between 87 when Greenspan crashed the stock market and 94 when they moved to um, this gradualism, uh, many, many small rate hikes, uh, you see Greenspan discussing this, that, you know, there's actually no inflation pressure uh, and uh, we really don't need to raise rates, but the markets expect us to raise mm. rates. So we need to raise the rate. <laughs> and it's very explicit in the transcripts that that is what they do. He says, we don't want to disappoint the market. Uh, so he sort of, I think, learned that lesson from the 87 when he first comes in, in uh, to the uh, chair and raises rates and crashes the stock market. He decided he doesn't want to surprise them or disappoint them. And uh, it puts them in a very strange position where they have to do uh, things that they don't think are necessary at all, but it would disappoint the market if they didn't do it. Yeah, like I started out in this business in, in like around 1979. And um, I was a floor trader at that time on the New York on the New York Futures Exchange, which was part of the New York Stock Exchange. And the only thing we really got out of the Fed was like every Thursday they would release the money supply numbers and that was it. But we've we've gone through this kind of gradualism where now it's like it's really open and, and explicit, like the Fed wants to communicate. But but half the time or more than half the time, it seems to me like as Powell, especially, he's just sticking his foot in his mouth. I tell people who subscribe to my report, I say, you know, the, the meetings where the Fed is going to adjust policy, the actual meeting that happens at 2 p.m. Eastern time, that's not a tradable event. But I tell them the 2.30 uh, uh, press conferences, like you go short on that every single time because you know he's going to stick his foot in his mouth. It, it's this, it's this you know, like this need that they have to explain everything and, you know, it, they just fumble it. They fumble it every time. So do you think that's like a bad thing now that, you know, they've gone towards this policy of we got to be really communicative about what we do? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I can see that. I mean, I, I think you follow his words a lot more closely than I do. Um, but uh, it's... Um, he... He is in a bit of a trap. Uh, so over this past 40 year period, what we've done is we have put inflation uh, under the, the, the Fed's umbrella, the mandate, and really it's the only one. Uh, and they've only got one tool, which is the Fed funds rate, which has uh no discernible impact on inflation that, that, that anybody can find it's the only tool they have that's all they can do and so what um yeva and i were arguing in that piece is you know if you look back at why did we establish the fed it's very clear why we did it uh, financial stability right we we had operated without a central bank until 1913 and we had the worst financial history of any rich country in the world. Every generation, we had a severe financial crisis and a depression. Every generation, we had one of those. So after 1907, when JP Morgan got all the bankers in a room and locked the door and said, nobody is leaving this room till you all cough up the money. Yeah, they were like, that was like, they were like a quasi-Fed before the Fed was even yes. created. He, they... 
he came together and said, look, we're, we're going to pony it up because this shouldn't be happening. And we're going to we got to support the system. I was going to I was going to bring that up because that that was in your article that I that uh, I uh, cited at, at the beginning of our discussion. It was never really the job of the Fed to control inflation. It was financial mm-hmm. stability. Yep. Uh, it, so if you if you go back 300 years, uh, the first central banks were created to finance the government. That was their purpose. Uh, and then by the mid 19th century, it was well understood. You have to have a central bank to be the lender of last resort, because even a bank like J.P. Morgan, they can't do this on their own and they have to worry about solvency and profits. So you get a central bank that cannot run out of money and doesn't have to worry about solvency. It can be, it can make losses forever if necessary. Okay. Uh, and so those were the two functions. We didn't want the Fed to finance the government. Americans hated a big federal government. So we, we were going to constrain our federal government. The Fed was not going to finance it. But it was going to be there uh, to prevent financial crises. That was its purpose. Now, gradually, it discovered open market operations. And then we, we had World War I. And he said, well, you know, the Fed ought to finance the government in war. And then World War II, again, the Fed ought to finance uh, the government. So gradually, the, we do develop this relationship between the Fed and the Treasury. And the Fed becomes the Treasury's bank. And, and blah, blah, blah. That's all MMT stuff. Um, but there was never any notion that the central bank was responsible for any kind of macroeconomic policy. That's the treasury. That's a fiscal function, not a monetary function. But over this past uh, half century, we have downgraded fiscal policy. And we said, no, they're not res- the fiscal uh, policy is not responsible or at least not solely responsible. Uh, It has a a much downgraded position. The Fed is responsible for macro policy. The Fed is supposed to give us, you know, the three things, reasonable growth, reasonably full employment, and price stability. So macro policy becomes the Fed's mission, and gradually it says, well, we really only need price stability, and then we will get the other two things as sort of a, a side benefit. Uh, yeah. The best thing we can do is is low inflation, and that will give us high growth and high employment too. Of course, there's no reason to believe that's true, but that, that was the mantra that Greenspan sold so that he could get away with only focusing on inflation. And where did financial stability go? <laughs> Right the Fed the is the greatest destabilizer we have in the economy, right? They yeah. completely switched. Uh, I I think also it's a, it's a function of just the politics of our time that is so divisive. Where for Congress, it takes the pressure of having to make those fiscal decisions off their shoulders, and they're just like we cede that to the Fed, but the Fed doesn't. It doesn't have the tools for that. I mean, uh, really, you know, like if, if you look at what happened during the pandemic and how the, you know, we had we had an historic contraction in GDP, um, and then it bounced right back as soon as we got that stimulus. The problem was we still had those supply chain issues. I, I just was on Fox the other day, and again, they were, you know, trying to present this argument that, oh, look at all this money printing. I'm like, yeah, there was, you know, there was a a fiscal stimulus, but at the whole time, during the whole time, the entire global economy was shut down. You couldn't, you know, create the supply which that money was, you know, needed to purchase. It's like, remember when Greenspan, he was interviewed, I think it was Paul Ryan back in 2007 with the the famous thing about social security yeah. when, when Ryan was like, do you think we should go private? And he, and Greenspan said to him, you know, the government can create as much money as it wants and compare it to whomever it wants. The question is, can you create a system that ensures 
the real assets are going to be there uh, for that money to purchase, right? It's about, and here's, here's the other thing. MMT has always said that. Like people who criticize MMT, the critics out there right now with these straw man arguments, it's like, oh, you just want to print trillions and you know, it's going to be inflation. We, we never said that. They ne There's nothing in the academic work, especially you, you know, people like Warren, Stephanie, nothing in there that, that has ever proposed or mentioned anything like that, right? Yeah, we, we always say targeted spending. <laughs> you need to target it. And uh, Yeva and I laid out in, in March when the pandemic first hit, a targeted spending plan. Uh, I don't think any MMT people advocated simply mailing checks to every American. Now, the, the first round, okay, so many people were behind in paying their bills and paying their rent and so on. Uh, that wasn't very dangerous, the first round. The second round was a bit more dangerous because the pandemic uh, disrupted supply chains I think much more than anyone expected. And then the, the Chinese uh, policy, I, I'm not criticizing the policy, uh, maybe it was right for them, but you know that had an impact on global uh, supply. And um, so this, the second round led to some uh, idiosyncratic inflation pressures, you know, very, very unusual inflation pressures. We hadn't seen anything like that before. Um, but probably that second round of checks was uh, uh, misguided. And, and also that kind of that kind of tied in with the, the Russia Ukraine situation where the sanctions, then we had this whole energy situation because everything was sanctioned and you couldn't get energy. And, and you know, I think I, I think right before, you know, the, the Russia-Ukraine thing happened, what was that, February of uh, 2022, we were starting to come out of it. I mean, things were looking better, and then, boom, we got hit again with the whole energy side of the situation, right? Yeah, and of course, for the U.S., energy prices are down, inflation is down, we're, we're, we're running about 4% PCE right now, uh, it's going to continue to decline. Um, I think uh, if the Fed had done nothing, uh, inflation would have followed the path that it's following now. I agree. Um, and, you know, it's going to get down. I think two, there is no good argument for 2% inflation targets. There is no good argument for that. Uh, we're going to get down to inflation that is low enough that it is not, uh, not disruptive and uh, uh, on its own. We don't we don't need to crash the economy uh, in order to wipe out inflation. Where did they come up with this two percent anyway? It just seems like an arbitrary like you just pull it out of the air. Like I think it should be two percent. Like why? You know well, why? On, uh, you can Google online and see uh, Powell trying to answer that question. It's very <laughs> hilarious. Well, because you know, I'm going to do that. Central bankers around the world. Well, you know, they decided two percent. There is no answer to that question. There's no reason why. And when you consider every index of inflation that we have is a human construction, and you make lots of decisions about what to include and how to include it in your index and how you're going to weight it and all that. And anyone who studies this says when you get to very low inflation rates, like 2%, you don't really know if prices are rising or falling because there's, there's so, uh, so much artificiality in those indexes that um, you cannot be sure. And that's why it's dangerous to have uh, something as low as 2% as your target uh, because you're not sure that prices are really even going up. Is it, isn't inflation anyway, if we talk about inflation or, or even deflation for that matter, when you boil it down, isn't it just a redistribution of income? I mean, because like in inflation, so like, yeah, debtors lose, uh, um, right? Or, or I'm sorry, creditors no, lose. Debtors gain. <laughs> debtors gain and, and creditors yeah. lose and vice versa in deflation. 
you know, uh, creditors gain and, and debtors lose. So basically, it's not like it's not like the money's flying out into outer space. It, it kind of gets redistributed in the economy. The economy looks different in its composition and the way the income flows around. But in reality, we should just look at it as a redistribution, shouldn't we? Well, it's somewhat of a redistribution, but you know, some of the items in the um, uh, index are imputed, so they're really not market prices. Uh, the uh, homeowner's equivalent rent uh, is an example. That's a huge component of the CPI. That's imputed. You're a homeowner, right? You're not paying more uh, rent on your own home just because that index is going up. So it's imaginary. It, it, the, and the other thing is that, you know, even if you uh, leave that one out and you, you've got the uh, consumer basket, you know, nobody buys the whole consumer basket. <laughs> There's lots of variation in how you as an individual are affected right. by this average number, say 4% inflation, and you also can change your behavior, and that's not going to be captured in the index. Now, with a lag, if everyone changes their behavior, uh, if some item goes up really fast in price, you can expect consumers are going to change their behavior. They're going to buy less of that one and buy more of some substitute. Gradually, we will revise the index to take account of that. But in the meantime, we're going to be registering high inflation because of that item, and people aren't even buying it anymore, right? right. So what I'm saying is it's very, very complex uh, how individuals are being affected. But what we can do is we can look at economies that um, have a measured, by some index, inflation rate uh, that is zero or negative versus economies that have a positive inflation rate, let's say 4%, and just look at how well they do. It tends to be true that those with the really low or negative inflation rates do not perform well. Right. <laughs> right. right. <Okay. laughs> you know, I, as an investor, and I, I try to tell people this all the time, like some of the best performing stock markets in the world right now are Turkey and Argentina. So like their their market, like if you're in their market in in your lo in the local currency, you've been taken care of. I mean, the market has basically paid you back for that inflation that you've experienced. If you're in a foreign currency, that's a different story, okay? So the rich people are complaining because hey, you know, uh my peso's not buying that much anymore or some or you know, my Turkish lira the other thing, like Warren Mosler, the other day, I was listening to him on a, a podcast and an interview, and he said there's ways like Turkey has made some adjustments, you know, politically. They've raised wages to help people deal with the higher prices. So there, there are mechanisms by which, you know, the government can compensate for what's happening, especially if it's a situation you know, let's say like a temporary situation because of the supply constraints or something like that. You can help people out, but you need to have the political environment to do that. And, and you know, I, I don't I don't see that here right now. Uh, let me ask you this, because we're coming up. There's two other things I want to talk about. One is uh, the debt ceiling. You know, the debt ceiling, we know that's an, an anachronism. It goes back to the days of the gold standard. It's ridiculous. It's a self-imposed constraint. You know, Congress uh, decides how much it wants to spend through its appropriations process, whatever. And then, boom, it's a done deal. OK, but then we run up against this stupid debt ceiling all the time. And then it becomes this political brinkmanship. And I was not bearish coming into 2023. I think almost universally economists were saying it was going to be a recession. I didn't see that. And mainly because I feel like Warren, the the interest income flows, those transfers were going to be big and they were going to keep people spending. But it I I don't know if we're going to see a resolution to this debt ceiling now. And that would 
that kind of might put us into a kind of some kind of semi or full austerity situation. How do you see that? Uh, well, very hard to to predict whether they will resolve this. We can hope that they will. Uh, I think uh, I lean toward recession. Uh, if you, yeah. you you looked at the um, the fiscal balance, uh, the deficit was declining. Uh, that is always a pretty good predictor of recessions. And um, add on top of that, the Fed's rate hikes that have um, crashed construction. So that that's one place where interest rates work, raise interest rates and builders stop building. They try to complete what they've started, but they're not starting new projects. Um, so there's a problem there. And then uh, probably the financial crisis is going to spread to some more banks. Um, so I think a recession is probable, even if they do reach a resolution. If they cannot reach a resolution, uh, we're really in a bind because people used to think, well, uh, Yellen can choose to make some payments, so we'll make payments on the debt and choose not to pay retirees their Social Security. And she has said very clearly, they cannot do that. They cannot prioritize spending. Um, so uh, they would have to do across the board or I don't know what. Um, some people are still pushing the trillion dollar platinum coin. <laughs> we we had a conference at Willamette uh, last month. And um, there are people who think that this is a real possibility. Although again, Yellen, just like uh, oh, back yeah. in the Obama years, yeah. uh, they say there's no way we're gonna do that. No Powell was asked about this. Well, would you allow them to do that? And he said, uh, we are the fiscal agent of the government. It's good he recognizes that. Yeah, because Yellen, I think when Yellen was Fed chair, she said she, she wouldn't cash the coin. Like she wouldn't, she wouldn't deposit it. At least we made some progress there, huh? Yeah. So he says, <laughs> I, I, I will leave it at that. But we are the fiscal agent of the government. So if... Uh, Biden and uh, Yellen can change their mind, I think Powell will go through with it. And of course, that's an easy solution. Uh, and yeah. then it dem demonstrates how silly the whole thing is. But I, I don't know. I'm not convinced that that's going to happen. I don't think so. It's a, because to me, it just seems like, not to me personally, but it seems like it, it's perceived as too gimmicky. Like the, it, people just wouldn't accept it. You know, they, they'd go nuts. Um. All right, so I want to ask you about this. Another thing for me personally that's just a constant source of annoyance and frustration is the so-called national debt. Like, I don't see how we've made any progress in terms of educating people as to what this really is. I mean, there is no debt. Everything mm -hmm. was paid for and people got dollars. And they're just holding their dollars, you know, in a different form, which are, are, are treasury securities, which are uh, dollar alternates. And we don't owe anybody anything. And I mean, it's just an operation, a very simple operation at the Fed to, you know, take back the treasury and then credit uh, a reserve account. But it's still, I mean, this is still a, a big thing. And you see a lot of leaders, on, you know, in Washington, uh, they're talking about this, and we got to bring down the debt. I mean, how do you see this playing out? Um, it it is very tough, and you know, Stephanie Kelton and I like the um, the approach of um, lack of uh, framing. It, it's the word that we use. Debt is a terrifying word. Right. Deficit. Deficit means, oh, the government must have done something wrong. It's a deficit, okay? I think that the terminology uh, biases people. Uh, you know, you. I'm sure you talk to people who don't know much about economics. I talk to family members and so on. And, you know, they'll, they'll rant and rave about the deficit and debt. And uh, when I dig a little bit deeper, they can't even tell the difference between a trade deficit 
and a budget deficit. It's right. all mixed up together. All they know is yeah. it's a really bad thing. Yeah, debt. It's the word that freaks yeah. them out. So I think trying to change the um, the the terminology that we use, you know, it's not a debt. This is our net financial asset. And thank you, Uncle Sam, for giving this to us. Right. It's the safest asset we have in our portfolio. It's uh, what we own, not what we owe, right? Right. So we're trying to change that um, uh, framing and... You know, Stephanie does this all the time. It, it, that is not a debt clock in Manhattan. Uh, that is uh, what the government Amen. owes us. Yeah, you know, that is our wealth. It's very, very hard. Once people see it, though, they never go back. Right. Once you see that as wealth, you never go back to worrying about the debt. It's like yeah. MMT. When the light bulb goes off in your head, you see everything completely differently. I remember that. That was my experience. When I first met Warren back in uh, whatever it was, 2001 or 2002, and I was at a conference at Bloomberg, just a few people, and he was, uh, you know, talking like on a, on a whiteboard and saying things like, uh, you know, exports are a cost and imports are a benefit and things like that. And, and, and the government can't run out of money. And I'm like, this guy's crazy. Like, I think I even, I was, I probably stood up. I was, I was like rude. But after I, I left, like, that was it. The light bulb went off in my head. And, and I think, um, luckily, I'm seeing that, too, among people who, like, have been following me on my channel for a while and stuff like that. But but anyway, it looks like uh, we're coming close to the end here. But I really want to thank you for coming on. And also, I, I, I want you to know how much I appreciate your work and the work that you've been doing. And I know that people who know you, uh, they definitely have the same sentiments towards you uh, that I do. You know, you've really done so much uh, to promote MMT and to help people gain an understanding. And I'm just saying, you know, keep it up, man. It's fantastic. Well, thanks a lot for the opportunity. All right, buddy. Well, um, have fun out there in Oregon. And uh, how is it out there, by the way? Uh, well, Northwest. Unfortunately, today it's living up to the reputation. It's raining. Raining. <laughs> yeah. I did, uh, back in February, I did a two-day wilderness survival course in um, uh, up in Washington. I uh, forgot exactly where it was, but the entire weekend, it never stopped raining. And we were sleeping outside under tarps. And, you know, making fire out of wet wood and stuff like I learned a lot, but man, was it uncomfortable. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Next time, take an RV. Yeah. <laughs> or, or a tent, right? I wanted to do it the tough way, just with a tarp. Boy, was that rough. Anyway, uh, great seeing you, buddy. And um, all the best. Okay, thanks. Bye. Right. Take care. Bye-bye.